Welcome to Focus on Claims with Ernie Bray, CEO of ACD. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Ernie with ACD, and today I have a very interesting guest. Um, I heard some shows that he was on, and I saw some videos out there about their company. I was really intrigued, and one of the examples he gave me actually hit home big time. Um, about floods and he'll tell the story today, but um, it was really exciting. So I wanted to get him on the show here, the entrepreneurial story. And today I have Bob Frady of Hazard Hub. Bob, glad to have you on. It's a pleasure to be here, Ernie. How are you today? Yeah, doing well, doing good actually. And, you know, I, I, you, you've been everywhere. seems like you guys are all <laughs> over the place. What's with that? Yeah. What's a, as an entrepreneur out there, what's with this marketing? I see you guys everywhere. You guys are, are really making a name for yourself. You know, it's funny, you just have to be, if you keep repeating yourself, eventually someone's going to pay attention to you. Like, yep. when, like when you get a kid and they're like, mom, 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 mom. After like the 50th mom, they, someone pays attention. It's kind yep. of like that with our marketing. Just a little yep. bit every day. Well, I'll, hey, I'm sorry, like I said, glad to have you on. So what have you guys been up to? I mean, what's some of the things I saw? Um, I see a lot on your social media. You guys are out there. I see uh, pictures of like that. You guys taking, seeing um fire hydrants and, and I see data about, you know, information, how close you are to the ocean and flood zones. Tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are first off and then, and like, what do you guys do? Sure. Um, I'm Bob, co-founder uh, of Hazard Hub. We're a bunch of data geeks who love data um, with a focus on insurance. And what we try to do is tell you all the bad stuff that can happen to a property whether it's a flood or a wildfire or an earthquake or a storm surge or a hurricane, wind, hail, tornado, all the, mm -hmm. all, the, all the hits. We try to deliver them in a consistent format so you can type in an address or latitude and longitude and get an answer or a whole bunch of data almost instantaneously so you can understand what the risks are of that property. That's what we do. And, and so when you look at what we really do, we just try to get the best lowest level data possible. Uh, sometimes it means driving around a neighborhood and finding the fire hydrants. Wow. Right now we count fire station doors as a proxy for equipment in the area. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a never ending quest for better and better data. Wow, so, so tell me about how you came up with the idea and, and got started. You know, with it. Well, I've been in geospatial for most of my career, which is basically geospatial is you take some data and you apply it to geography. So, you know, a lot of times people want to know what's the construction of a building, for example. And what we want to tell you is, well, what's around that building that can impact that building as well. So not just the structure, but what's around that structure, because it makes a big difference in the, in the inherent danger of that structure. So uh, my co-founder and I, met, gosh, over 20 years ago at a company down in San Diego doing geospatial in the retail and utility industry, and then ended up working together again at a company called CoreLogic uh, about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, my former mother-in-law, this is the story you were pointing to yeah. earlier, uh, had a house or still has a house on a river in western massachusetts and the river came up it does what it does and it took out her basement and it was a rather significant loss and so i looked up all the data because i had access to it yep and i said oh gosh she's not in a flood zone but she's right next to it so i asked her did anyone ever tell you that you are right next to a flood zone and she said no you know the insurance company didn't tell her because they don't cover flood and the, and the mortgage company didn't tell her because she wasn't in the flood zone, mm -hmm. even though she was just a few feet away and still really in danger of flood. So um, we went to the, and, and the sad thing is that the reason why she had a loss was because her basement filled up uh -huh. and, her sump, and her sump pumps failed. So for the cost of two nine volt batteries, to power the sump pumps, she ended up losing a significant amount of money uh, off, off the, off the non-claim. And didn't probably have flood insurance then, right? No, no flood insurance. So it was a tough, it was a tough call. So uh -huh. we, we went to the folk and I, and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to 
to get involved in the consumer side of the business as well as the B2B side. Yep. And CoreLogic, you know, they weren't interested in that. And that's okay. That's their right. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't show us the door, but they did point to an object that had the word exit over the top of it. So we, uh, we, we, we kind of figured out that it wasn't necessarily the right place for us. So a few years went by, we left, and, but we saw more and more data coming out and better and better technology. And we thought, okay, now's the time to sort of put the band back together. And five, uh, four years ago, we started it and we're rolling. That's, that's awesome. And that story that you told, and I heard it on the, another podcast, hit home directly. I, about four years ago, we bought a house. Uh, there was a seasonal river back behind us, but it seemed to be in really, you know, and deep enough that I thought it would just flow down the path of the property. And then lo and behold, a huge storm hit through San Diego. Um, everything overflowed, went into the pool, went, started to come up to the house. And, you know, Bob, about, uh, I don't know, three hours later, I was on local TV. They had a person out there with a microphone in my face said, hey, uh, how's it going? You know, like they wanted to get a live story about how it was with the floods. And I'm sitting here going, okay, now I got to get, you know, the dry out companies to come in. They rip yeah. out the floor and they do all that stuff headache massive headache and i'm like well, why weren't we told i mean there's you know it's not a flood zone it just what's going on so i went in i went to my property those you know those documents you get with you get all these thousands of pages and you sign your document yep. i look at a map and i'm seeing oh flood zone oh it's over across the street about 30 feet away it's not on yep. our property we're not in a flood zone and now i am spending thirty thousand dollars to replace a bunch of flooring and, and and damage to the house no flood insurance now i do yep. have flood insurance now and Something like your uh, company would have warned me ahead of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. We had actually, we had a friend of ours who moved to Houston right before the storms and mm -hmm. uh, Hurricane Harvey, I think it was. And she's like, well, you know, they, our flood model showed a little bit of danger, even though she wasn't in the flood zone. She's like, I'm going to get flood insurance. And mm -hmm. she did. And then weeks later, Harvey came and luckily the policy was in force but it went halfway up the wall on our first floor um, oh, wow. in, the, in, in Houston. And they were out of commission for almost a year because it took so long to fix everything. But luckily, at least they had the knowledge to know that they should potentially do something about it. And, yeah. you know, there's always times where even if you tell people you're in a danger zone, they're still going to go, that's eh, never going to happen. And then it does. And people are surprised by that. And that's always, that's, those are the ones that sink the most because it's I, like, you should know these things. Yeah. And I think that information's power. I mean, any homeowner would want to know that. And it's great. Like, you know, I see things from our business. We're in the auto insurance space. We're dealing with claims that happen. But I mean, if you can prevent these things from having, ideally, like you're saying, that's, that's awesome because that really can save a homeowner <laughs> from a lot of money. Like I look at what I had to spend on my situation and that's, that's a big potential savings. You know, it's, it's not just the, I mean, listen, the money's important. There's no doubt about that, but it's also the interruption of your life. You know, it's a, uh, yeah. it's a humongous pain to have a claim. And the people who are often most diligent about taking care of their properties are people who've had a claim before because they're like, wait a second, bad stuff can happen to me. Yeah. So they take a little bit more care uh, to take care of their property. I mean, most people's homes are their single biggest investment. So right. we think that given the data and they'll want to help take care of it. So, 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 so you don't you have say, to Bob, get involved. Yeah. So what would you say like the differentiator is with you got, you know, your company compared to others doing similar stuff. What's like the, the, the driving thing that differentiates you? You, you know, in, in every company, there's always a, a person who's like, we should do this and we should do that. We should try this and try that. And that person either gets stuck in a corner somewhere or many times gets fired or leaves because they always want to innovate, but they can't. The organization just doesn't support innovation. We have three of those. The three co-founders of our business are always thinking, okay, let's do this, let's do that. And that's the biggest difference is, you know, we had a customer, uh, we, we, have a, we have a database that we call the Breaking Bad database. Uh -huh. And it's, and it's a database of formerly clandestine drug labs in the U S and the reason why we built it is because I was, I was 
I was watching too much Breaking Bad and I talked to one of our customers who's in the mm-hmm. ENS space and said, wouldn't it be great to know if a house used to be a drug lab before you insure it? And they're like, yeah, that would be really great to know. So we went out and built the database. I didn't have to ask anybody. Yeah. And now we have a database of formerly it's, clandestine drug labs. It's funny you say that. Um, uh, Cause I, I, we were visiting a relative, gosh, it was about six or seven years ago. I think it was in Northern California. And they had mentioned just in passing, like, oh, that, that house over there is completely damaged from the inside. They were like growing stuff in the house and it's like yes. rotted out the sea. So you, is that the kind of things you're talking about? Like things yep. that were, oh, wow. Yeah, because, well, because there was a story and, you know, there's always edge case stories, but mm-hmm. somebody bought a house. It used to be a drug lab and they made meth in it and meth's poisonous and yeah. nobody remediated the house before it was sold. So this family with two little kids moves in and then wow. they have to move out because the house was a drug lab. Jeez. And now the realtor gets sued and the previous owner, it, it just, be, it turns into a mess. That's, that's all great information to have. And what you said about like, what's the differentiators that you, you, the three founders in that drive, I know what you mean. I mean, working at the, I felt that way working at, for insurance companies when I was there, I had the drive for innovation, but you know, they have their own ways to do things. And, you know, you, you find out when you're there, eh, it's just not the place for me. Cause if you have that entrepreneurial drive, you know, you know, you have to do it. And that sounds like what you guys are doing. You're like, Hey, you know what? We're different. Yeah. And you know, I don't, I don't blame carriers for being the way they are. You know, people in the insurance industry more often get rewarded for not being wrong than mm-hmm. they do for being right. You know, when, when yep. you're, when you're, central KPI is loss ratio. The first word in that is loss, you know, avoid that loss. And so innovation is hard for a lot of these companies because that's not how they measure success. Yep. So So we, we just keep thinking, we'll just keep thinking of things, even we'll think it's logical, we'll develop it and then we'll find out uh, how to apply it into the industry. Yeah. Let me ask you, so getting started, in the business, you know, we already had the experience, but getting the company started, yep. what was like, you'd say the challenge of getting the message out or what your product was and what it offered? Like, did you do a lot of pitches or did you go to conferences or what was the way to get out there and, and really get visibility? Well, we had a, a, a little bit of an advantage in that we had done this before. Mm-hmm. Um, so we knew what we were doing, but that's, you know, I have this expression It's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who knows what you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But we decided to do, we we used, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book, The Lean Startup. Um, I've heard it, yep. And we used those concepts. So I have this humongous belief that you can change your life for a thousand dollars and because we did it. Uh, Mm -hmm. What we did is I spent a lot of time just drawing what I wanted things to look like. And then I paid a designer. Yep make these screens. And then we took these screens to some people we knew and they said, what do you think about this? And they go, this is great. I said, Mm -hmm. if we built it, would you buy it? They said, yeah, sure. I said, well, how about a down payment? And they gave us our first check and still a partner today. Um, But that's how we did it. So we got started with just a drawing, a bunch of screenshots. And we called a few people we knew. We got some roots with two of them actually. And then we were off, off and running. Yep. And that, that's the fun stage. I really enjoyed that part because now you look back and you say, wow, look how far we've come. And that, that's the fun part. I think there's just a, there's something inspirational about that when you're in that startup phase and you're making those drawings, you keep all your drawings like that. Do you keep it all for like history? Yeah, yeah. I got them all. Yeah. They're yeah. on the, they're on the share yeah. drive somewhere. Hey, what would you say? Like, you know, everything we see is about insure techs out there, you know, everybody trying to push it. What was it? If I had to say, give me a couple tips for if you're an insure tech listening to this podcast right now mm-hmm. and you want some tips from somebody who's gone down that road of pitching, what are some tips you'd give somebody or expectation wise that's, that's taking the leap into this? Well, I would say a couple of things. The first is that the decision timeline from a carrier is measured in years and not in weeks or months. So you have to be prepared for that. So, I mean, we had, I had a call with a customer and they're like, I remember what we talked back in 2017. I'm like, yeah, I remember that too. You know, so you're looking at a three to four year sales cycle for many aspects of the insurance industry, especially as you get closer to the core, which is underwriting and actuary. 
Mm-hmm. The so if you're going to go after that area, be prepared for a really long sales cycle. Okay. Um, the second thing is to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. Focus on what you're good at and then find people who can fill in what you're not good at. For example, we didn't want to have a lot of salespeople. You know, we're pretty good at selling, but we didn't want to have a lot of salespeople. They're tough to manage and, and all that stuff. So we developed a partner network. Uh, and we have a lot of partners who help us to overcome that speed problem uh, because they're already, a, it's, it's a lot easier to sell an additional thing than it is to sell the first thing. Yep. And the partner allows that. And then um, the third thing is see what the competitive landscape looks like and attack the landscape where it's weak. So another reason why we decided not, we, uh, ISO and CoreLogic are our competitors. They're giant billion dollar companies. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they probably spill more money and they spend more money on juice in a month than we do generating revenue uh, in that same month. The, you take them on directly and you, mm-hmm. got, you got issues. You got to find out where they're not so strong and attack them there first. So do a competitive landscape, see what's missing from the landscape, but then look at that distribution model to say, how can I distribute this most effectively? Uh, and go around. Don't, if, if you're small, don't go head on, go around and then go head on, attack them from the back. Flank them. Find, the, find that niche then what you're saying. Find yeah. the niche that where you can really focus. What would you say if you wanted to give us a story like, what are some, the challenges that you've experienced in going into the insurance companies where you actually maybe met with some resistance that you didn't expect, or maybe actually got welcomed in and really people really interested. I mean, have you had both sides of that where like some good stories around any of those? Oh, sure. Yeah. The, the first question, if you go into one of the top 20 carriers, Mm -hmm. the first question they're going to ask you is who else is using you? And And if you're starting up, it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, so the answer that I learned to give, and it's kind of fun to give, but it also shortens the meeting quite a bit. Um, to say, if you have to ask me that question, you're not ready for what I have. You know, you got to take it away <laughs> a little bit. And, yeah. and you got to find the pieces of the industry that are ready to innovate when you are. Okay. So we had a lot, we had and still have a lot of resistance uh, from the big established uh, players. But in the mid to smaller market, I'm shocked that our most inventive customer is probably one of our smallest. You know, their, their annual premiums written are probably somewhere around, you know, 6 million a year, which is not very much, but they're super innovative with what they do because they have to be, you know, their survival depends upon being innovative. And so that was such a surprise and there have been a great customer and refer us to people and, and, and surprising that the most innovation occurred in some of the smaller aspects of the market. That's very good. Would you say the pandemic, have you seen any change uh, in the pandemic in this cycle? Have there been more people reaching out or less, or would you say that people, because in our side and the auto side, we've seen a lot of people wanting to move toward the virtual claims process. This has been kind of a real driving factor, probably, you know, because of social distancing and things like that. So we've seen a lot of innovation in claims side. But on your side, are there still people that um, has it caused people to maybe look into more of these solutions now or are they pulled back? What do you feel? I kind of look at it like it's, it's like at home. You know, when you're sitting at home and you're working from home, you have more time on your hands. So, you know, you have that junk drawer with all that stuff in it. Eventually you get to that junk drawer and you're like, all right, I gotta organize. I'm going to organize this closet. Finally, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think what's happened for us is so many people have more time that they're able to investigate things that they might, Mm -hmm. they might just push it off. Plus with all of the move to digitization and lowering the footprint in terms of how much information you have to give to get a quote, it's accelerated the, um, the push towards what we do. So COVID has been good for us, not because of COVID itself, but because it's freed up people's time to investigate newer and smaller companies and the fire has been lit under them to be more um, streamlined in the way that they do things. And that's where we really help companies. That's good. That's good info. 
Um, let me ask you this. Uh, how have you, you talked a little bit about the partner selling and, and on our side, we always talk about partnerships are important. I see a lot of insure techs we are partnering with on our claim side and a lot of, there's a lot more openness to the partnership aspect of it. If you could speak a little bit more to about what you're seeing in partnerships, insure techs working together, more people, how do they, you know, what, what are you seeing in that area? Well, you know, the idea to not partner a lot of times is built out of arrogance. And it's like, oh, I'm, I've got the perfect answer. And frankly, even if the biggest company used our data, it's still not the entire answer. There's other pieces that need to be knit together to deliver a great answer. Like, for example, I can't tell you roof condition, but there are companies out there in, in the space that can tell you, okay, here's the condition of the roof and when it was probably last replaced. Uh, like a better view or like uh, a Cape Analytics can tell you those things. When we put those together, there's a synergy that's greater than either one of us by ourselves can bring. Now, so that means you should partner because it's a better answer than both of those by themselves. Right. I would say the, re the reluctance to partnering in the past a lot of times has been because of technology. It's been really hard to move data between yeah. companies. APIs have sort of changed everything. You know, we're an API company. We, the, the first big pivot that we made was to become an API company. So when you want to work with us, it takes 10 minutes to hook up to us. You know, if, if you're a developer, if you're not a developer, it might take you forever. That'd be super simple. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, here's the API, go. And you're, and you're, and you're signed up with us and you're live in 10 minutes. And that's because of technology. You know, one of the key decisions we made was let the technology do the work. And so APIs let you partner much more effectively than non-APIs. Oh, yeah. and, and that's why we partner much more. And I think that, you know, we've gone from at the beginning of the process, we had a lot of conversations around what's an API again, you know, mm -hmm. to carriers recognizing they have to open up their systems to accept APIs if they want to be competitive down the line. And I agree. I, I think I, people are realizing that in all aspects of the insurance side, all aspects. And let me, you know, when you guys, you work obviously out with the underwriting side more on the front end. Yep. Do you see any opportunities on the claim side or how you could partner on with carriers on the claim side? Is there some real back and forth synergies that could be potential there that's not even, even being utilized today? Well, I or, think, you know, the claim data is sort of, it's, it's like, uh, uh, oh, what's his Indiana Jones, and, and he he finds the the crypt. The Ark there. of the Covenant. The, Ar the Ark of the yeah. Covenant. Yeah. Claims are like the Ark of the Covenant, where people are afraid that if they open up the lid, all their faces are going to melt. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes inside of a carrier, the claims people don't talk to the underwriting people. You know, there's there's a breakdown in communication on that side. We think that by examining claim data, it can help you to improve your underwriting by understanding what the variables are that maybe predict some of those claims or yeah. show the, the preponderance of some of those claims. Like we have, we have one non-customer who's come to us because we have, they have a, a hail problem, a hail and lightning problem mm -hmm. in Texas. It's like the differences between lightning risk in Texas are a factor of 16 from one area to another because we have data that we've built that other folks haven't built that say, this is what the risks are from this area to the next. So the claim experience can inform the underwriting experience. Uh -huh. It's sometimes very, very difficult to pry people's fingers off of the claim data so we can do that analysis. So there's a lot of potential then, and you're saying though, there really is, that could really. Yeah, we just got accepted to the Lloyd's lab in, in London. And one of the key factors is we wanna take your claims data and we wanna run it past all of our data and models to okay. show you that this is how it wor how it can work on the front end, and you can price more effectively or underwrite more effectively. Wow, tell me about tell me about the Lloyd's Lab. So what so what is that exactly? Yeah, you know most of the most of the gnarly risk in the world reside resides in London, mm -hmm. and the Lloyd's Syndicate is or the Lloyd's of London group, if or however you want to. There's like fifty to or it. sixty syndicates, right? That work yeah. in one building and they in big underwrite. Building. Yep. Okay. And, they, and a lot of times the underwriting is person to person, which is great in some ways, but then mm -hmm. you have a large loss and everyone wonders what happened. What we're looking to do with Lloyd's is to figure out how do we integrate 
our data retrieval into what they do. So when someone comes to them to say, underwrite this book, even if there's a hundred locations in it, here's what the data tells us very quickly. And then we can come up with a better price for this rather than just take it, you know, the word of someone mm -hmm. or what's worse is user defined uh, variables. Like one of the big faults in, in like everybody goes, well, the current methods of, of actuarial analysis are the gold standard, but they're dependent upon people telling you information. It's like, you know, are you a good driver? Yes, I'm a good driver. How many miles do you drive back and forth to work? Oh, I drive three miles back and forth to work. It might be right. 30, but they drive three. So all of these models are predicated upon manual input of data from the insured, which is a fault. We're trying to figure out how can we replace some of that manually gathered data with automatically gathered data. And so Lloyd's going to hopefully, we're going to try to figure it out with them. Do you, do you get to go over there for a while and you spend some time over there? I'm supposed to be there for 10 weeks, but due to COVID, it's all virtual this year. Oh, wow. Normally, normally it's 10 weeks in London working in the Batman building there. That would be and, nice. I was supposed to go speak there in, uh, at InsureTech Insights uh, back in March, and I was ready to go, and then everything hit, and I have oh, to yeah. go next year. Yeah. Oh, you know, I think my wife is the most disappointed of everyone because she's like, you know, I work from home, so I can work from London as well. Hey, I was going to take a trip out to Stonehenge and see that, and I was all set to go, and <laughs> darn, you know? Yeah, hey, was, crazy times. Yeah. Hey, we're almost ready. To, I want to wrap it up real quick here. We're almost good, I'm running out of time, but I want to hit uh, the question about the, the – the lightning, how does that work again? Because I used to live in Arizona at one time. Those thunderstorms would come through. There'd be lightning during certain times of the year heavily. How does that, you guys track areas that have heavy we, lightning? We've tracked for the, since 1999, we've gathered uh, Doppler data. Uh, okay. And then you use that, how many times has it happened in this area? How many times has it happened in a radius of this area? How many times, what's been the intensity that it's happened? And then you model it to say, this is all great from a, from a market standpoint, but from a, your house to that house, how do you anticipate what the average expectancy is of that event happening? Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. You take reams and reams of data, you build some, what you'll call machine learning or AI around it. Okay. And then you come up with a, here's the one year probability of getting struck by this, by lightning or hit by hail or tornado or, uh, or wind damaging wind. Wow. You guys got, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you guys have a ton of data. I mean, anybody writing homeowners policies and like, um, you know, all these kind of things that, that would be a huge asset to have. So, yeah. I mean, very exciting stuff. So, yeah. Hey, w tell me about some, is there anything you, that is coming out exciting news that you'd like to share with the audience or anything you guys have going on? That's, uh, that you'd like yeah. to, to tell us about the, the, um, there's a lot. It, it, I, we have to have a whole nother podcast to discuss all of it. I think sort of the most exciting thing is a lot of elevation models are based upon either 30 meter or 10 meter resolution mm -hmm. where every 10 meters of elevation changes. Uh, we're moving to one meter. Wow. Uh, so every three feet, the elevation will change. And think about that from looking at your house and the contours and how everything works. That's very exciting stuff. It's gnarly it is really tough to work with this stuff and we're still in the process of figuring it out, but we hope to launch it by the end of the year. Well, that will increase like accuracy level immensely. I mean, you Enormously. get down to that level, that's going to be huge. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, uh, our, the future of our company doesn't depend upon it. Um, but we do know that it's a great opportunity to sort of jump past a lot of what's out there right now. Well, that's awesome. I mean, this is a lot, a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, this could, like you said, this could be take another, another half an hour, hour more to even just discuss all this, but it's been great having you on, Bob. Appreciate it. If you could do me a favor, let, let the listeners know how they could get a hold of you, your company and, uh, and get in contact with you if they're interested in what you have there. If you want to reach me, it's Bob at hazardhub.com. Real simple. Uh, www.hazardhub.com is our website. And on there, you can see some of the risks for free that we have. You can type in an address and see what the risks are. So I encourage everybody. We, we're huge believers in trying it before buying it. So we want you to fall in love with our data, and then you'll buy it, not the other way around. 
That's awesome. Well, hey, Bob, it's great having you on. Thanks so, so much for all the information and great having you on. Oh, it's my pleasure. You take care. This has been Focus on Claims with Ernie Bray, President and CEO of ACD.